American West had long been the domain of indigenous peoples, Spanish, and Mexicans. In the post-Civil War period, there were inspiring stories of risk and commerce for adventurous souls pursuing mining, ranching, and farming. But the Indians faced hardship as their traditional way of life disappeared. Railroad expansion ushered a new era and indigenous peoples, whether rejecting or accepting change, were at the mercy of political forces that made life challenging. World history. World history reveals a long list of conquerors defeating and taking control of weaker societies. This was the case on every continent and in every era of history. In his book, Conquests and Cultures, Thomas Sowell writes, the often tragic history of Western Hemisphere Indians parallels the, the history of conquered peoples around the world, not only in terms of the suffering endured, but also in terms of the betrayals of agreements and the contempt often shown to the subjugated peoples. European nations broke treaties with each other and there were countless betrayals in Asia and Africa as different groups in those continents jockeyed for power and control. This, this has been the human experience in biblical times. To no surprise, the American government likewise broke treaties with Indians. In America, control became easier for whites when disease devastated Indian populations. Indians faced the superior technology and numbers of whites. They were at a disadvantage in many ways. For one, Indian groups were exceedingly fragmented. Unification of different tribes was rare. For example, the Navajo people in their language recognized two categories of humans, themselves and enemies. Before the Civil War, Europeans witnessed warfare between Indian groups as one group allied with one European nation against another European, European nation supported by another Indian group. One example is the Huron aligning with the French against the Iroquois who aligned with the English. Some Indians enslaved other Indians. Early European settlers discovered that Cherokees, for example, in Southeast America sold Indian slaves. Before the Civil War, the Indian white encounters on the Western frontier were minimal and mostly peaceful. The Plains Indians included the Apaches, Comanches, the Navajo, the Cheyenne, the Sioux, and many other groups. Once sedentary and agricultural, these people in the Plains became nomadic when they encountered and began using the horse that the Spanish introduced to the Western Hemisphere. Because there was no world power to stop the American expansionist goal of claiming land from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, Indians were unable to make alliances with a supportive European power and thus had no assistance as Americans surged across the continent. In the first half of the 19th century, the perception of the plains was that of a great American desert. The destination for the early pioneers was not the plains, but instead California and Oregon. Later, the image of the plains, the image of the plains improved and whites sought good farming 
and ranching on the plains. With no good place to relocate, the Plains Indians had two options. Fight a war they could never win against superior numbers or submit to the American government and, and adjust their way of life. In 1870, Indian leader Red Cloud toured United States, the Eastern United States, and concluded that the only viable way to save his people was by reconciliation. He understood that the power of the United States was far too formidable. As what had happened in 2000 years of European history, a stronger group defeated and took, and took control of a weaker group. The geography of Western America shaped the outcome between Indians and whites. There were few navigable rivers on the Great Plains. Militarily and economically, waterborne transportation played a smaller role than had been the case in the Eastern United States, where impressive rivers emptied into the ocean, providing efficient and less costly transportation with other ports. The Western Plains also experienced bitter cold in the winter and blistering heat in the summer. Fertile land existed, but there were large areas of desert and semi-desert land. Consequently, the geographical conditions resulted in the Indian population spread thinly over vast areas. On the one hand, the small concentration of Indian groups made them vulnerable to attack by hostile Indian groups and later the American army. But on the other hand, the conditions made it challenging for invading forces. American military forces often had to be supplied by difficult and expensive overland routes and in many places could be deployed only by a, by a foot on foot or on horseback before the era of railroad building. In the face of increasing strength of American soldiers, Warrior societies on the plains attempted to protect their people the traditional way. Traditionally, warrior societies guarded the bands camped in TP circles. They also rode flank when the bands traveled, watching for game, grizzlies, and signs of enemies. Warriors depended on their horses. The warriors carried small shields, short and powerful bows, and short lances for close combat. Warriors preferred bows. Before the arrival of repeating rifle, the smoothbore muzzle loaders were less effective than bows. Counting coup brought the highest honor to a warrior, striking an enemy with a gun, bow or any other instrument was often considered a great achievement. The act of stealing horses or weapons from an en enemy was honored. A, a warrior recorded such honors with appropriate insignia, such as beaded strips on their war sh shirts or pictographs on teepees. Chief White Bull, a Sioux, a Sioux re recalled one meeting with the enemy, quote, when I was 16 years old, I accompanied a war party and fought with the soldiers. They retreated and we chased them. I was riding a steel gray pony at the time, one of the fastest I've ever owned. I was ahead of the others. This was the first time I counted coup. On many occasions, the violence on the plains between the Indians and American government was brutal. 
as Thomas Sowell explains the ferocity and mercilessness of the struggle on both sides generated burning hatreds and hideous acts of revenge and counter revenge that poison relations between whites and Indians for generations. A key event was the creation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1834 that sought to control the Indians with the latest thinking, some of which reflected the humanitarianism of the day. Ideas formulated in Washington, however, played out differently in practice. Often federal Indian agents were corrupt. Overall, the dominating theme was to encourage and protect whites as they settled in the West. Washington policy was to ensure safe passage across the plains, prevent intertribal warfare, and secure the land for future white settlement by getting the Indians to live within designated boundaries. As for the indigenous peoples, they simply wanted to maintain their traditional way of life. There were hopeful signs, but treaties signed in the 1850s between the United States government and Plains Indians in both the North and the South of the Plains were not honored. Contact between Indians and American soldiers became increasingly deadly after 1860. For example, the Santee Sioux lost control of much of their ancestral land because of pressure from white newcomers. In 1862, relegated to a strip of land along the Minnesota River, the Sioux attacked white settlements and killed approximately 500 settlers. General John Pope, commander of US forces in the territory responded with a large force and many Sioux were captured. The government convicted 300 for murder an Episcopal Bishop asked President Lincoln to exercise mercy and Lincoln commuted the death penalty for all but 38. Minnesota settlers who had connections or identified with those murdered were furious when only 38 were hung. Further west, the governor of Colorado territory opposed land treaties with indigenous peoples. With a force of 1,000 soldiers, Colonel John Shivington attacked a friendly band of Cheyenne in Colorado in 1864. The numbers vary, but the massacre probably resulted in as much as 250 dead Cheyenne. According to one interpretation, men and women held white flags of truce and mothers held babies in their arms. Shivington denied there was any white flags. One of Shivington's, Shivington's men allegedly justified the humane action against innocent children with the statement, quote, nits make lice, end of quote. News of Shivington's action galvanized public opinion. People in the East were disgusted with the horrific treatment of the Cheyenne and an investigation by Congress found Shivington guilty of excessive force. The following statement is from the Congress's Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. Quote, as to Colonel Shivington, your committee can hardly find fitting terms to describe his conduct. Wearing the uniform of the United States, which should be the emblem of justice and humanity, 
holding the important position of commander of a military district and therefore having the honor of the government to that extent in his keeping, he deliberately planned and executed a foul and dastardly massacre which would have disgraced the various savage among those who were the victims of his cruelty. Having full knowledge of their friendly character, having himself been instrument to some extent in placing them in this position of fancied security, he took advantage of their apprehension and defenseless condition to gratify the worst passions that ever cursed the heart of man. It is sought by some that desire for political preferment prompted him into this cowardly act that he supposed that by pandering to the inflamed passions of an excited population, he could recommend himself to this, their regard and consideration. End of quote. The American people believed the plains should be settled and farmed, but the brutal action of Shivington was inexcusable. In the following year, many Plains Indians joined in uh, a number of Sioux Wars, one of them being the Sioux War of 1865 to 1867. They were frustrated with the whites who denied them use of the land. Mining, ranching, and farming activities disturbed the traditional hunting and farming lands of many tribes. The buffalo were increasingly wiped out by white hunters, especially in the 1870s. In 1866, the Sioux successively ambushed and killed Captain William J. Fetterman and his 82 soldiers in the central northern region of today's Wyoming. The official report of the incident provided grisly reading. Quote, eyes torn out and laid on the rocks, teeth chopped out, joints of fingers cut off, brains taken out and placed on rocks with members of the body, entrails taken out and exposed, hands and feet cut off, arms taken out from the sockets, ears, eyes, mouth and arms, penetrated with spearheads, sticks, and arrows, punctures upon every sensitive part of the body, even to the soles of the feet and the, so and the palms of the hands." End of quote. In 1868, a treaty was signed at Fort Laramie that established two large reservations at Oklahoma and Dakota territories. Within six years, whites disregarded the treaty and opened up the region of Black Hills, South Dakota. Colonel George Armstrong Custer led an expedition in the sacred Black Hills of the Sioux. The Cheyenne allied with the Sioux to resist the white intrusion of miners and soldiers. This became known as the Great Sioux War of 1876-77. The Sioux leaders were a young war chief, Crazy Horse, and a medicine man, Sitting Bull. In 1876, Custer and his 7th Cavalry attacked a native village at Little Bighorn River, not knowing that the encampment included over 2,000 Sioux warriors. Led by Crazy Horse, the Sioux wiped out the 265-member uh, army. It was the last major victory by Indigenous peoples against the American army. In the following year, approximately 600 Napiers under the leadership of Chief Joseph traveled more than 1300 miles from Eastern Oregon to Northern Montana. They were attempting to elude the American army. Seeking to reach Canada, 
They kept the U.S. Army at bay. Their supplies exhausted. They were finally forced to surrender after 75 courageous days of travel. Chief Joseph stated, quote, hear me, my chief, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. The government sent them to Oklahoma where disease and starvation weakened and, and killed many. Apache tribes in Arizona and New Mexico offered stubborn resistance, but leaders such as Geronimo were eventually persuaded to surrender. For the Indians of the Great Plains, disease, alcoholism, the arrival of railroads, and the virtual extermination of the buffalo resulted in their near extermination. The Indian Wars in the West gained much attention in newspaper reports. According to historian David Kennedy, where the whites wiped out Indians, the engagement in many white history books was usually a battle. When the Indians wiped out whites, it was a massacre. Strategy when practiced by Indians was treachery. Primary accounts, however, provide some evidence that ruthless actions by government forces were viewed by the public as a massacre. There were white soldiers who showed respect towards Indians. Approximately 25,000 soldiers were sent to the West to protect whites in their activities. And these soldiers had a difficult assignment. Historian Thomas C. Leonard explains, quote, the rules of war demanded restraint and a fine regard for the enemy's rights. But it seemed as if the same civilian who interpreted these rules wanted quick work on the battlefield. The United States government itself broke the treaties that promised the Indians land, yet expected the, expected the army to keep the peace through neutral trust. Colonel Henry B. Carrington, who wrote the official report on the Fetterman fight of 1866, again, that was the engagement where there was just some brutal treatment of the bodies of American soldiers. Carrington prevented a reflective rather than vengeful assessment of the Fetterman carnage. He pointed to the irresponsible speculative immigration. He explained that the Indians' treatment of the dead soldiers was due to their desire to disable their enemies in the afterlife. And that's an explanation of, of the US soldiers' bodies being dismembered. Other soldiers were interested in Indian culture, but in the end, the army maintained a hard-nosed strategy. An account by Sioux Medicine Man's Sitting Bull blames whites for the blood spilled in Indian white battles. Quote, the white man came on to my land and followed me. The white men make, made me fight for my hunting grounds. The white man made me kill him or he would kill my friends, my women, and my children. Thomas, historian Thomas Leonard clarifies the determination of whites to defeat the indigenous peoples. Quote, however noble their image of the savage may have been, it is important to recognize in all these Indian fighters a fundamental conviction that the price of civilization was not too high, end of quote. And yet it was not bullets that killed most of the indigenous peoples. Overall, 
less than 4,000 Indians were killed by direct warfare since the arrival of Europeans. The main killers instead were diseases such as smallpox and measles and cholera. In the end, the Indian way of life was broken. In 1887, Congress passed the Dolls Severalty Act calling for the breakup of Indian reservations. Rather than communal ownership of land, the Indian heads of household were to have small farms. To develop private farms, Indian heads of household received equipment for farming. Any Indian who left the tribe became a United States citizen. So this, with Dawes, this was an attempt to fix or make a, try to solve the problem of um, what to do with the natives. And the earlier, uh, arrangement did not seem to be working very well, especially when the American government were breaking these treaties. So trying to get the natives away from communal ownership of land and more of kind of private ownership where you'd have these Indian heads of household having their, their own farms. The last major Indian resistance took place in 1890 at least uh, an incident that was, uh, was where there was a lot of violence. A shaman named Wovoka told his people that if they practiced the rituals of the ghost dance, the buffalo would return and white people would go away. The message spread and Indians danced and chanted translate for days. Ghost dancers wore white ghost shirts, believing that they could stop a bullet. When Sioux leader Sitting Bull promoted the ghost dance movement, the government worried about Indian uprisings and it set out to arrest him. Uh, tragically, Indian police murdered Sitting Bull on December the 15th, 1890. Less than two weeks later, the US government with machine guns killed 146 Sioux at Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota. The ghost dance episode was over. The major battles between Indians and the American government attracted much attention. But it's important to note that deadly encounters between Indians and settlers was rare. One calculation is that there were only 400 pioneers killed out of 250,000 that passed through Indian territory. There was also support of public opinion for Indians. Writer Helen Hunt Jackson documented the white portrayals of treaties in her book, A Century of Dishonor. The book shocked political leaders to do something about the abuses. And the Dawes Act was one response. While assimilation was realistically the best options for Indians in material and moral terms, it was a tough pill to swallow. By 1885, there were almost 200 reservations. The Dawes Act reduced the overall acreage. Some Indians benefited under the new land holding arrangements but the chief beneficiaries were probably the land speculators. In 1900, the Indian population was about 250,000 Indians and the majority lived in poverty. A daunting task 
Indians somehow had to deal, quote, with a radically different and ever-changing reality around them, end of quote. Whereas Indians struggled against the forces of modernity, American citizens seeking a new life in the West had significant encouragement from the government. The Homestead Act of 1862 allowed settlers the title of 160 acres of public land, providing they occupied the land for at least five years. The Timber Culture Act of 1873 provided homesteaders an additional 160 acres if they planted 40 acres of trees. The Desert Act of 1877 provided 640 acres of land for the price of $1.25 an acre. The stipulation was that buyers promised to irrigate part of the land within three years. For land that was deemed unsuitable for cultivation, the Timber and Stone Act of 1878 allowed purchasers to buy 160 acres of this land for $2.50 per acre. Historian Paul Johnson writes, quote, never in human history before or since has authority gone to such length to help the common people to become landowners, end of quote. There was ample promotional literature that painted the West as the promised land of milk and honey, Typical were the words of the governor of Wyoming who declared that the rich soils represented a new garden of Eden to all practical everyday farmers who will put their hands to the plow and not look back. Settlers pushed the frontier westward and some historians saw this process enhanced in American individualism and democracy. Historian Frederick Jackson Turner argued that the frontier, quote, made America and Americans what they were. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad spurred successful settlement of the, in the West. In 1869, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific met at Promontory Point, Utah. So we have the first transcontinental railroad completed. The Southern Pacific Railroad ran further south and was completed in 1883. The projects generated, generated many jobs and many foreigners, such as the Chinese, found employment. The Northern Pacific and the Great Northern Railroad were two other transcontinental, rail, uh, transcontinental lines. So we have the Northern Pacific, the Union Pacific, the Central Pacific, the Southern Pacific, this all opens, opens up the, the West. The explosion of railway construction saw railway mileage increase from 53,000 miles in 1870 to 200,000 miles by 1900. So close to four fold, fold increase. The railroads not only advanced transportation of peoples and goods and improved communication, but they also were a source of land for settlers. Congress provided land grants to railroad companies, and these companies offered much of this land to settlers for good prices 
that range from two to five dollars an acre. The opening of the West resulted in more land put into cultivation than ever before. Between 1870 and 1900, over 2 million foreign born settled in the West. This was an impressive number, but even a larger number came from the Eastern United States. Farmers discovered that the so-called Great American Desert had promised, particularly the years of higher than normal rainfall. While not all farmers could afford large scale irrigation, it was the answer in dry regions. A mix and small and large farm farms was favorable since large farms sped up the development of agriculture technology that benefited everyone. On the plain, sodbusters contended with, the, with an environment without much wood for houses, barns, and fences. Rare were strands of trees to provide protection from blizzards in the cold winter months. Settlers were heroic, raising their families while facing the challenges of drought, crop pests, and prairie fires. One old joke revealed much, quote, living in Nebraska is a lot like being hanged. The initial shock is a bit abrupt, but once you hang there for a while, you sort of get used to it, end of quote. When communities sprung up, churches were usually the first community structures built. Some churches were sawed and timber structures. More effective mechanization of farm work, better grains, and the introduction of barbed wire permitted great expansion in production to supply the growing population in the Eastern states. Cattlemen also made their mark, the cattle industry. It became apparent that cattle were able to survive the harsh winters and feed well on wild grass. Cattle drives north from Texas to the railhead in Abilene turn into a bonanza for herd owners. One huge cattle drive took place in 1866 when Texas cattlemen pushed over 250,000 cattle northward to the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Grazing along the way, the cattle gained weight. There was money to be made. An essential component of the cattle industry was the cowboy. In the enormously popular dime novels, they were romantic figures who modeled independence and freedom. The cattle bonanza peaked during the 1880s when severe winter weather and summer drought hit hard. An increasing number of cattlemen used barbed wire to fence in their land. They collected hay to feed the cattle during the winter. Thus, the age of the open range was short-lived. It involved into the age of the cattle ranch. Mining was another major story of the West. The California gold rush in 1849 was the start of a series of mining booms that had a major impact in the West for the remaining century. There were rich deposits in the mountain and plateau regions. Approximately 100,000 prospectors gathered at the Pike Peaks region in Colorado where gold was discovered in 1858. In the following year, there were gold and silver strikes in Western Nevada. Other mining operations were in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. 
While much of the wealth extracted in the West passed in the hands of investment bankers and corporations, many ordinary people did reasonably well employed in the vines, in the mines, or finding employment or entrepreneurial success with businesses linked to mining operations. As new mineral deposits were discovered, boom towns emerged. If the myth of the frontier exaggerated the opportunities of the mining West, it nevertheless contained a good measure of reality. To conclude, after the Civil War, the greatest contact and conflict between whites and Indians took place on the Western frontier. Although deadly encounters with white settlers was rare, the dreams and activities of farmers, ranchers, and miners adversely affected the lives of the Plains Indians. The indigenous peoples faced disease, the decimation of the buffalo herds, corrupt politicians, and displacement by white people who pursued their dream of individual advancement and economic self-sufficiency. The opening of the West was a key reason for the United States becoming, becoming a powerful and prosperous nation. There was a great deal of suffering and sorrow for indigenous peoples, yet most Americans expected the Indian to yield to civilization. This had been a common expectation in many other regions of the world. Thank you.